Hey guys, so this is Isaac again. Um, I spoke to most of you when I was doing some of the AS level um, masterclasses about a month ago and the A2 ones as well. Um, coming today to you to give a kind of masterclass, like a, a little run through of the question paper, one of the multiple choice papers for this week, the first paper, uh, summer 15, page question paper 11. Um, and what I'll do is, as I've done before, is to go through the questions, kind of go through some of the basic concepts that are coming up, uh, explain the answers as, uh, as and when necessary. And then if you guys keep your questions and message them to me, some or message them to the group, some will be doing a live session later this week to kind of discuss some of the, um, some of the, the issues you might be having. Okay. So I'm starting, starting quickly. Question one. Question one is, uh, which combination of events must increase the level of scarcity in the economy? So scarcity is often called a basic economic problem. It's the reason that we have pricing. The reason that uh, most of the economic concepts we have work is that we don't have infinite resources. So we're looking for something that would increase the level of scarcity in here. If we have less certain weather patterns and fashion for greater consumption, so people are using consuming more, uh, weather patterns are kind of shifting, meaning you can't necessarily produce as much, especially in agricultural products, then that's going to increase the level of scarcity within the economy. Question two. So here we've got a case where you've got some people shipwrecked on a tropical island and they're allocating their time between gathering coconuts and fishing. And each individual is equally productive in collecting coconuts or catching fish. So here we have the question, which diagram represents the production possibility curve? This community says no. Production possibility curve reflects uh, kind of the opportunity cost of uh, switching between two different, uh, producing two different goods or services or providing services. Uh, what we know here is that each individual is equally productive in collecting coconuts or catching fish. And therefore, we know that the PPF is going to be straight. Uh, it's not going to be... Uh, B, C, or D, then it's got to be A. Go to uh, three. Which characteristic of money is most simply to uh, effectively restore value? So what gives money its value? Well, if it's divisible, that means that you can uh, kind of divide 100, 100 pounds into 250 pounds or 520 pounds or 10, 10 pounds, etc. Liquidity is just how liquid money is. It's basically how easily you can access cash. That's not really what helps it become store value. Portability is how much you can take it around. Well, not really. Well, money is portable, and that's that's an advantage. Maybe really something like gold, which is particularly heavy. But the thing that gives it its value is the scarcity. So if you have a limited amount of money, that's why having some of it is valuable. If there was infinite amounts of money in the world, then it wouldn't be that valuable. And that's one of the things we see with inflation, hyperinflation, where people pr continuously print money. It means that you uh, kind of diminish the value of the note in your pocket, and the value of money goes down. Okay, question four. So a worker can make 10 hats or five pairs of shoes in a day and three hats can be sold at the same price as 10, two pairs of shoes. So not only can the worker make more hats in this situation, but the hats are more valuable. In fact, uh, uh, three hats are worth the same as two pairs of shoes. So if the hats are worth five pounds and the pair of shoes are worth five pounds, then, uh, and then the pair of shoes are worth £7.50. You can see that you can just sell, sell more hats. So what should the worker make? Well, the worker should make hats only. Especially because they're much more productive at making these hats, they can make double, and the hats aren't uh, half less valuable than the shoes. The shoes are more valuable than the hats, but the shoes aren't twice as valuable as the hats. So it's still more productive to just make more, more valuable to just make just make hats. Okay, the diagram here we have uh, demand curves, and this is public transport. So we've got the as the price of public transport goes goes up, we can see that demand is going to go down, uh, quantity demand. So what's going to mean that um, we shift from D2 to D1? So we've got D1 here, the cursor is, and then D2, D1, D2, D2, D1 is there. So what's going to cause that shift? Well, we need something that means that at every single level of demand, um, except when demand, uh, price by transfer is free, the consumer's demanding more public transport. So their price, they're willing to pay a higher price for it. So we're the cost of individual running individual cars falls. That means the person can actually more like drive their car. So it's the demand for quanta uh, for public transport shift down. If the price of public transport falls, we'd expect them to take more, but that would be a shift out of the um so we still remain at D1, but we shift down. We're looking for something that's changing the price at which they're willing to start driving there. Uh, price of public transport falling, therefore not. So the public transport services 
being reduced. Uh, again, not the case. Uh, if you reduce public transport services, uh, you'd like to see people take less public transport, but individuals are no longer able to drive in public transport. They're sold more means of getting around. We're likely to see an increase there in uh, the demand. So it's B that's going to cause that shift. Okay, so moving on to question six. We have a table that shows the price elasticity of demand for goods for different goods and services. Here we've given that price elasticity. You know, price elasticity is always negative because for most for most goods, normal goods, because we assume that as uh, the price goes up, demand goes down. So if we increase the price, we charge by one percent, which I'm um, since we're totally expected to increase. So we're looking for things with um, when you increase the price, we need a fairly elastic. Uh, we need fairly inelastic demand. Sorry, so we need something where the demand is less than one, uh, minus one. And our two answers here are football tickets and light bulbs. Uh, you could run the calculations on that. Uh, that's not something I'm going to go through now. It'll take a, take a couple of minutes, but it's something like uh, whoever is giving the live session, if it's me or someone else, is, is definitely able to do. Okay, looking at question seven. In the diagram here, we have this area that are citing O, P1, M1 and Q1, so this little area here, and that area is equal to that. What is the value of price elasticity of demand if the price is half from P1 to P2? Well, we're saying that there's no change in expenditure, and therefore, if we increase price by 10%, you're going to, see, for example, you're going to see quantity of demand fall by 10%, and therefore, because the revenue stays the same, the area remains equal. Uh, there must be a, a unitary elasticity of demand which is minus one. The answer is C. So here we're, sorry, here we're looking at four firms which are supplying in this market. We don't know what the market is. The market supply is 50 units at $20 and 100 units at $40. So you see the table and show the market share of these prices. So which firm does not have a normal upward sloping supply curve? So here we can see that as price goes up, this firm does not have a normal upward sloping supply curve. Uh, it's D. Because as price goes up, its market share is falling uh, by half. So the, the price doubles, um, the market supply is uh, falling by by uh, half as well. So I mean, it will not have that normal market sloping characteristic. Okay, question nine. The price of a good doubles, but firms are able to increase production only by 10%. What is this an example of? So we know that prices are jumping up almost by 100 percent per doubling. The firms are only able to keep production while they've got an elastic supply. They can't respond by as much to to a stimulus of price uh, with their supply uh, supply capabilities. So here in number 10 in the market, we have a surplus of a good. And we're asked which change would cause the market to come to an equilibrium. So if there's a surplus, i.e. there's too much of a good, what you need to stimulate to, what you need to stimulate demand. Uh, which of these stimulate demand? Well, uh, or you need a decrease in supply. Um, so a decrease in demand wouldn't help. That would actually make a surplus worse. A government minimum price to get help. An increase in supply again would only hurt worse than surplus. So the only answer can be a fall in price that stimulates a fall in supply and an increase in demand, therefore eliminating the surplus. The surplus is when you have uh, excess kind of demand or excess supply within the market. Okay, question 11. So excess supply in the market is surplus. Excess demand would be, excess demand would be a shortage, so you would have too much demand relative to supply, have too much supply relative to demand. It's a surplus, sorry. Question 11. The market for sugar is in equilibrium. The disease affects the sugar crop, and newspapers support harmful health effects of consuming sugar. Which combination of changes in demand is my majesty's event? So we've got, and here falling. Supply falling. So if you get a fall in both of those, the obviously the disease affecting the sugar crop is the amount of fall in supply and the newspaper report on the effects because people aren't going to want to eat sugar. So we get to more falling. So it's A. Okay, question 12. Here we have a diagram showing a demand curve for journeys on a toll road. A toll road is a road we have to pay to drive on it. Uh, if there is if there is a reduction in the toll from five to three dollars, what is the resulting increase in the daily consumer surplus? So we see here we've got our consumer surplus, which is denoted by the point of the demand curve quantity, so when it's a thousand, so when it's five dollars, uh, we know that a thousand are consumed, so we've got uh, that, that much consumer surplus there. So we've got 
five, pull that point, and when we increase it, we go to there, so we need to find out the difference between those two areas. So first, let's work out, we know that that's too high, so two dollars, and that's a thousand dollars, so we know the increase includes that area there, which is two times a thousand, so we can write down two thousand. We also know that it's increased by this triangle, we know this triangle is a thousand dollars along, it's two dollars high, or half base times height, so we have a thousand, um, thousands halved is 500 times by two is a thousand. So 500 times two dollars is a thousand dollars. So we've got two thousand here, a thousand there, add it together equals three thousand. So that simply relies on you being able to calculate yeah, that area and then the triangle as well. Remember the equation for triangle is half the base times the height. Okay. What is an economic first question? What is an economic reason why hospitals are often built to fund by government? Well, hospitals are not a public good. You know that. They are very expensive to build and run, but they could still make money if you charge for healthcare. Hospitals cannot use the price to allocate for more. Well, they can, they do it in many countries like America, but in the UK, one of the reasons is that we say that hospitals have positive external benefits. So if you get vaccinated, for example, uh, you're not going to spread diseases, uh, having a healthy population is beneficial for people, uh, employers, etc. So there's many external benefits from hospital treatments, which means that often they're not taken into account and the, the Price for the private market would not really provide enough health care and provide enough hospitals. So the government steps in to fund and build these hospitals um, in order to kind of assist with that. Okay, so here we have the diagram showing the costs and benefits of four markets um, over here. And we need to find out, let me just zoom out a bit so we can see the, the question. There are four markets here. Uh, each market is showing social costs, private benefits, etc. Which pair of diagrams should be So, for a positive consumption externality, we're looking for um, marginal social cost being. Um, uh, we're looking for uh, somewhere where marginal social benefit is higher than marginal private benefit. Uh, and clearly, uh, that's being shown here on. Um, on two, where you've got the marginal social benefit above marginal private benefit, this would be a negative externality, where marginal social benefit is below marginal private benefit. And we're looking for a negative production externality, and that's where the marginal um, social cost is up and to the left of the marginal private cost. So uh, you have a negative production externality, so we're looking at two and three there. So quite simple kind of diagrammatic analysis of externalities there. Not an issue. Let's just see how we do for time. Good. Nicely. Nice to try okay. okay, question 15. Which statement about cost is correct? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. I had to go grab a glass of water. Okay, so yeah, we talk about question 15. Which statement of cost is correct? So here we have the statement that external costs only affect consumers. That's not true. External for effects, uh, external costs affect third parties, that's the nature of an external cost. Um, opportunity costs affect all transactions, well that is true and that is the right answer, but we're going to talk about why and the others are wrong as well. well. Obviously we know opportunity costs affect all transactions, if you decide to spend your money on one thing, you're sacrificing spending on another, and that's the very definition of opportunity cost. So then we've got C, which states that private costs only affect producers. That's again not true. Private costs affect consumers as well. Uh, private costs just apply to any individuals in the economic exchange. Uh, D, social cost affects all members of society equally, not necessarily the case. Social costs can affect um, people, for example, the social costs of building an airport, the, no the noise pollution that results from that greatly impacts those who live in the airport versus those who don't live in the airport. So it's not necessarily the case that social costs best spread evenly across all members of society. Okay, question 16. So the government is considering building a high-speed rail link. Uh, why would it not proceed with the project? Well, here we have the point that the social cost is greater than the social benefit is the answer. Uh, and the reason being that if the government was trying to build a, a rail link, if you have great social costs, that it's going to do more damage than the social benefit, then that's that's not the reason the government isn't going to do it. The government is generally, we, we accept concerned with social costs and social benefit calculations. If the social benefit was greater than the social cost, I can see the government would obviously build the railway, rail link. If the private cost is greater than the private benefit, uh, then the um, 
the government won't really care because it's a private cost. Um, the external benefit would be greater than the external cost. Uh, probably generally, generally the case, but here we're specifically concerned um, social, social. That would, that's right. If the external benefit is greater than the external cost, then obviously the government again would build it. The government likes external benefits unless the external costs are detrimental, but that's a slightly more normative behavior. Answer. The answer is for certain D. Okay, question 17 here. So this is a slightly more technical question about taxes. Here we have a question that's asking where we have the production of a product, a good, generates a negative externality that increases output prices. So the negative externality gets worse the more you produce. So let's say something like pollution, where if you're producing uh, 100 units, of, of the good, you're, you're producing X amount, whereas if you're producing 150, you're then polluting more. So yeah, as you produce more, you get more of the negative externality. Which form of government intervention is the most useful? So would a direct income tax help? Not really. It might be good for cleaning up, but it's not going to tackle the amount of the externality and the amount of production. All we want to do is do something to increase out. A specific indirect tax, well, to an extent, that might help, but it's not going to be as uh, as uh, effective as what we'll find in natural option. The reason specific indirect taxes work is specific taxes, just like set amounts. Uh, if you set your specific tax too low, uh, that's not going to really help. <clears throat> a subsidy here is actually going to do the opposite. Why would you subsidise an industry? I give them more money to produce something that's negative externality. But here, we look at the definition of envelope tax. It's a percentage tax based on the value added by the producer. So. It's a percentage tax of, uh, of obviously, so for example, you might have an average tax of maybe 10% of cigarettes or 15% of fuel, for example. Most taxes we encounter in the world are these kind of average taxes, it's like a tax where it's a specific percent of expenditure. And this is what's actually going to really reduce the sex uh, because if you're taxing based on how much they're producing, then you're going to incentivize them to produce less and take that, take the cost of having to pay taxes into account in the production decision, essentially getting them to what we refer to as internalise the externality. So we're getting them to take account of the external cost through the Sabrador tax, which accurately reflects the cost as a percentage of, uh, of its production, thereby incentivising it to decrease. If, for example, it was a um, specific tax, you wouldn't actually incentivise such a massive, uh, such the right level of production because it wouldn't reflect uh, the quantity produced, it would just be a flat, flat kind of specific tax. Okay, here we have uh, question 18. So we've got the government placing a maximum price P1 on the agricultural product, and the supply of one condition for this product is shown in the diagram. So you've got supply and demand and price. What will the outcome in the market be for this product? So we've got the government sticking up this maximum price there. Um, actually, I, th I have a feeling the answer I've highlighted is wrong here by accident. So the outcome in the market for this product here, when your government's charging there, is clearly that you can see supply is going to be there and demand is going to be there. What does that mean? Well, we're going to see a surplus of the product. And I can actually check that answer now. So, okay, 18. Wrong one. Let's see if I yeah. So the answer would actually be that there's a surplus of product. The answer should be pretty soon. Oops, no, I'll just trying to highlight everything. But plus, so now that you've got this max, maximum price, up here we assume they're going to charge max price. And you're going to get the Question 19. Country M, we have which specialise in the production of cars, or country N specialise in the production of televisions. And then they each other. What is most likely to reduce this level of specialization of trade? Well, if these people are going to uh, arise in productivity and rush across from and television, they're just going to continually trade because they're really, country M is just going to be even better at doing cars and country N is even better at television, so they're going to stick to that. What if, let's imagine C, the answer to B, but let's imagine C, there is a decrease in the cost of transporting cars and television between M and N. Uh, no, decrease the cost is actually an increased trade. They're going to love doing that if they don't have to pay as much to ship. There's an increase in the mobility of fats production within M&M. They're just going to become even more efficient at producing. Uh, mobility of fats production means you can more easily get machines around, etc. workers around, etc. If you can do that, you can produce more more effectively. So if each one is getting better at producing what they're better at producing already, then they're just going to continue to be special, continue to specialise in trade. So the answer is B, because if you get change from a fixed to a floating exchange rate between M&M, then 
you're likely to see a, re a reduction in level of specialization because the exchange rate is likely to be more volatile. Um, they're not going to be have as much stable pricing between each other, uh, and that's going to affect the level of trade between the countries. Question 20. Diagram D, a country in the curve, really important good, which we have here. And the country is imposing a tariff. So a tariff is when, when you import something, you bring something into the country, you have to pay the price. And here, the import of the tariff is so that's like a tax on imports. So which areas measure the resulting loss in consumer surplus? So previously, consumers were paying that price, um, PW, so they had all this consumer surplus there. Now they're having to pay the tariff, so they're paying PC. So the loss in consumer surplus is this area X plus Y. As we were saying earlier, when we were analyzing trade to consumer surplus, it's just the difference between triangles. Area X and Y. And what did the government revenue gain? Well, what's the quantity when you charge the new price? It's here. This point there, that's quantity. So we're going up to there. And the government are being paid all the tariff revenue, which is this area between PC and PW. So PC and PW times by that is clearly equal to area X. So while X plus Y is a loss in consumer surplus, X is the gain in government revenue. Nice, easy diagrammatic analysis there. Okay, 21. So here we have a base year. Uh, which combination of export and it's just a random year? Which combination of export and import price changes work the greatest effect on a country's terms of trade? So what do we want to, to impact on terms of trade? Well, in terms of trade, uh, the ratio between imports and exports in the country, uh, a greatest impact is going to be when they're moving in opposite directions. Um, so an increase by 1% and a decrease by 1% in the other. Uh, we really want to have like a positive, great impact, positive impact on terms of trade. So an increase in impact or prices by 1% and a decrease by 1% in import prices are really going to affect how, how much the, the country's uh, term of trade, in terms of trade are uh, impacted. So the answer is C. Some people might have said A. However, we have to remember the direction in which these changes are going, a decrease in export prices. Uh, it's likely to mean that you're, you're exporting, exporting less and an increase in prices because you're going to import more. 22 here. Okay, so here we've got a table showing the record balances from the country's balance of payments accounts in 2012. And we've got what was this country's current account balance. So here, nice, they often love asking these questions where you just have to kind of do the accounting. So we need to know what's incorporated in the account. In the current account, well, we know trading goods is, so we've got minus 20 on there already. Um, we know the trading services also is, we've got plus five, so that's going to take us to minus 15. But we know that net income is as well, so that's going to take us very nicely to, uh, let's do that's my head, minus 15, minus 7. We know that net foreign transfers is actually also included, so minus 7, minus 4 is minus 11. But we know that net foreign loans are not included on the current account balance. Therefore, the answer is going to remain at minus 11 billion. OK, so it's all about knowing what's incorporated in the current account, in the current, sorry, in the current account balance on the balance of payments, and then just doing the accounting. And that should be fairly simple. Okay, question 23 here. So here we have a table showing the changing structure of employment in four countries. Uh, this is between 1980 and 2012. And we've got the question being which country did not follow the same trends as the other three countries between 1980 and 2012. So we're looking at trends here. Changing structure of employment. So let's look across the country. So Australia has at this point quite high levels of unemployment. Most people are employed in services, kind of few people employed in agriculture and stuff like that. Here we have a big bump up at the 2012, a big bump up in the number of people employed in services, and a small reduction in the people employed in the agriculture industry. And most of the people coming from those so there's a little bit for the unemployment rate stays fairly stable. Okay, Canada has again three very heavy services in 1980. Fairly unemployment. And here we see again the little reductions there and a big boost in services. So we're looking for that kind of trend. Let's check where the career works with that. Korea, much higher agriculture, uh, industry quite high. There we go. Uh, and in Korea, we see a massive reduction in agriculture, a massive reduction in industry, and a really, really big boost in in uh, services. Here, what are we looking for? Well, 6.2 agriculture, yeah, seems okay. There's some 2.1, yeah, that's a full. 21 down to 7, yeah, a big boost in services. Okay, so not much difference there, but let's look at the unemployment trends. So here, we have unemployment goes down. Unemployment goes down, unemployment goes down. 
Here, unemployment goes up, so we can clearly see that Japan is not following the same trend. But here it's just analyzing the relationships between the different sectors in 1980 and 2012 and isolating the one that means that which country doesn't follow the trend. So we're looking for a difference in the movement of direction. Remember, that's what a trend is. Trend is the direction of movement of statistics over a period of time. Here, so 24, we're aggregating demand in the economy, and this may indeed decrease as a result of an increase in, what is it, well, how the economy and demand is decreasing, is it going to decrease as a result of consumption expenditure? Of an increase in consumption expenditure, nope, an increase in consumption expenditure is going to increase aggregate demand, an increase in government expenditure is going to increase aggregate demand, and investment expenditure as well. Also negative on the uh, Aggregate demand equation, remember, it's consumption plus investment plus government spending plus exports minus imports, or imports are a negative. You boost the negative uh, lever in that equation to increase import expenditure, then you can clearly see the aggregate demand is going to decrease if there is no compensating factor. That's the why the question asks aggregate demand in an economy may decrease. Okay, moving on to question 25. So the table here shows the CPI rate of inflation as a percentage um, in the US from 2006 to 2013. Uh, what can we conclude about these figures in the period 2006 to 2013? Well, there was one year of constant prices. Uh, not the case. We can see that throughout, throughout this period, the prices were continually fluctuating. There were three years of deflation. Can we see that? Uh, no, because there's sometimes it's going down. There's one there. A year of deflation there. Uh, so, well, we can't really see whether there's continued years of deflation, two years in a row of deflation, that's not the case. But only four years of inflation, that's not the case. But were there eight, because every one of these is showing some degree of inflation. Inflation is not zero, except for 2008, was kind of zero point one. But there were eight years of rising in the cost of The real cost ride whenever there's inflation. So here, every single year is showing a positive percentage change in cost of inflation. Therefore, we can claim there are eight years of rising in living cost. Okay. Finish up now the last four questions. So 26, how might an increase in the general price level lead to a rise in real household expenditure? Um, so if we're increasing, we get inflation. Why might people need to spend more? Well, why might people spend, sorry, why might people spend more in that situation? Well, I think people, the answer is A, because if people think that in the future there's going to be even more inflation, so if prices went up last month by 2%, we think they're going to go up by 3% next month. And you know that you're going to need to buy stuff now. Buy it now, because in that way, if you bought it now, you know that individuals aren't going to, um, you know, you're kind of hedging your bets. You're saying, well, if I, if I buy now and price is going to go up in the future, it's going to be cheaper to buy now. So if people think the prices are again going to go up, then an increase in the price level now, people are going to, is going to stimulate those expectations and people are going to, are going to spend more now. That's uh, quite a common concept. This concept is based on forward looking expectations. Uh, and what we call an economics adaptive expectation. So you base your expectation on what the future is going to be about what the present or the past period was. Uh, that's something that someone can touch on a little bit. It's something worth explaining. Okay, question 27 here. Um, between 2011 and 2013, my street retailers reported that expenditure on home product and imported goods was reduced. Consumers did not take out loans as the economy was in a recession. And what is the likely result of this? Well, in A, we have a decline in the deficit in the trade account. Um, so, A is the answer. So, consumers weren't taking out loans. Uh, what is the result of this? Well, the trade account, um, if people are not taking out loans, right, and people are importing goods, and the number of imported goods is reduced, right, then people are not going to tra- uh, export, uh, import as many goods. So, we're going to spend more money on, uh, on exports. We're not going to import as much, and therefore the deficit on the trade account, which is when imports are greater than exports, <clears throat> imports, remember, being a negative, a deficit on the trade account. If we're reducing that one, we're going to get a decline in the deficit. 28. What does not directly increase the supply of pounds sterling in the world currency market? So we're looking, oh, I want to highlight all that. We're looking for something that's going to increase, directly increase the supply. So what, inc- what drives supply and demand in the world currency market as well? It's demand uh, for sterling based on supply, based on people demanding for sales directly. Higher interest rates and lower interest rates can change, indirectly change demand for sterling, as can an increase in investment opportunities in foreign capital in Latin America. Perhaps people might be indirectly demanding dollars or supply of pounds sterling for some reason. 
But we know that an increase in sales of the United Kingdom exports to the U.S., if the U.K. is selling more to the U.S., well, they're going to supply more sterling to U.S. people, U.S. customers, so that they can then use that sterling to buy. So we've got an increase in supply of sterling as well as an increase in demand of sterling on the foreign markets. 29, uh, there's a depreciation, a depreciation in the country's exchange rates. If wage costs remain unchanged, what would be the most likely consequence? So what would happen if you have a depreciation, when you depreciate your currency, exports increase? Uh, and if wage costs are remaining on change, meaning people don't need to pay any more money, firms don't need to pay any more money, well, if you're an exporter, you're going to make a lot more money because you're suddenly exporting more and suddenly you're not having to pay your workers anymore, so you get more revenue coming in. Costs haven't increased, therefore you'll get more profit. It's a very simple, simple analysis there. Question 30. Here we have the currency of a small island, economy floating against the US dollar. Probably not a wise decision, but Hey, that's what they do. The Ireland's government introduces foreign exchange control restrictions on the citizens. What is the likely effect on the international value of the Ireland currency and of the dollar? So, what are we thinking? Well, what's happened? Well, the, go- the government of this small little island has said, why well, you can't, and it has got these foreign exchange controls, which means it limits the amount of dollars you can buy. So, how is that going to affect the dollar value? Well, this is a small island economy. The dollar is the biggest economy in the world. We're likely to not see any effect against the dollar, right? So that's why the answer for the dollar would be no effect. However, why would the currency of the island, we see that there, you know, that rises. Um, B, why does the island currency value rise? Well, if you're restricting the amount of um, kind of other international currency that people can buy, well, they need people that are demanding uh, island currency value suddenly, and therefore its, it's value is going to rise. So you can see that the answer is B. So, that was a very quick run through there. Um, I'll do another run through of the second multiple choice paper for this week. If you have any questions, message me uh, on the Slack or there'll be a live session. I don't know who will be doing the live session uh, later this week. So keep your eyes out for that. But enjoy. Uh, thanks for listening and speak to you soon.